Hello, and welcome to today's virtual public event, A Country in Flux, Recent and Future Policy Shifts in China. My name is Ryan Haas. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, and I'm honored today to serve as moderator. Our goal for the event today is to shed light on factors that are causing policy shifts inside China and what they may tell us about China's future direction. To help us think through these questions, we have an all-star panel with us. This includes intrepid NPR journalist Emily Fang, who reported from big cities and small towns across China throughout the COVID period and is now joining us from Taiwan. She also earned the Shorenstein Journalism Award for her reporting throughout that period. We also have Bill Bishop, the founder of the Influential Sinocism Newsletter, who is also a keen observer of political and economic developments in China and their impacts upon foreign policy as well as markets. We're joined as well by John Culver, a 35-year CIA veteran who briefed numerous presidents throughout his distinguished career. He currently is a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council. And last but not least is Chung Lee, the director of the John Thornton China Center at Brookings and an expert on elite politics in China. In terms of our format today, I will kick off the conversation with a few questions. We will have an interactive discussion amongst the panelists, and I've encouraged them to, to jump in and, and comment on each other's views so that hopefully we'll be able to draw out a range of viewpoints. And we will reserve time at the end of the event for questions for our global audience. If any of you in our audience would like to pose a question to this panel, please email events at brookings.edu or contact us on Twitter at brookingsfp using the hashtag China Politics. So to start, I'd like to pose a question to all of us on the panel. Following the party Congress, the conventional wisdom seemed to be that Xi Jinping was in a very strong position. More recently, following uh, the reversal of the zero COVID policy and loosening of re regulations on the property and technology sectors, there have been some that have argued that, that Xi has had to bend to forces beyond his will. So I'd like to get your sense. How do you evaluate Xi Jinping's standing today? Perhaps we could start with Bill, uh, followed by Emily, John, and then Chung. I think you're on mute. Okay, three years of Zoom and I'm just figuring it out. Uh, sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me on the panel, Ryan. Um, so uh, how do we evaluate the, well, I mean, she won, uh, he's a three-peat president as of this morning uh, with a unanimous vote. Um, I think uh, obviously no one was surprised by that. Um, I, I think, you know, we look back at the, the 20th Party Congress last October where um, I, it really looks like she effectively got through the Central Committee on up really his choices for personnel. And so I think going forward, um, we're only just starting to see how that's going to play out through the system. But but generally, I think he's quite uh, in quite a strong position. Uh, I also think that there was a lot of weirdness between the party Congress and now. Obviously, we had the the U-turn on dynamic zero COVID, which was quite chaotic, and we still don't have a good answer of what happened. You also had the death of Jiang Zemin and the funeral in the morning period. And so I think there's there's just some stuff that looked a little kind of off or wanky over the last three or four months that... Now, as we get out of the two sessions, I think we may start seeing a little more clarity that, and my baseline scenario is that he's um, really, there hasn't been a lot of pushback and there's not going to be, and that this is uh, really the most powerful leader and certainly in our lifetimes. Yeah. Emily, does that sound right to you? How, how do you think about she's current standing? I think it sounds about right. I think on paper, he has all the important bases covered. And I think the way how smoothly two sessions has gone this year and the unanimous vote that you saw today, him taking the podium immediately after making his pre-prepared speech, of course, because we knew what the outcome was going to be, was a very clear sign that he has all his ducks in order. But the downside to that is there have been a number of mistakes and he has to own all of them because he ultimately is the one who is in power. And if we see any policy uh, clarifications after two sessions is done to see where the country is going for this year at the very least, that ultimately is going to be attributed to Xi Jinping if it goes badly and if it goes well as well. I think zero COVID, the reversal of that was quite chaotic and people were not happy about it. But in some ways, it was the ultimate demonstration of power because he was able to flip a switch based on whatever reasons motivated that sudden change that 
turned an entire country around 180 degrees from a path it had been on for the last two and a half years. So was it messy? Was it a mistake? I think there's a lot of arguments that say yes and yes, but I think it was also an absolute demonstration of power. So I wouldn't say that he's been weakened by all of this, but I think just we're seeing what the, the, the natural downside is of consolidating so much power, which is you've also got to be ultimately the person, the face responsible for all of these actions. Yeah. John? Yeah, just to build off Emily, especially zero COVID policy was Xi Jinping's policy. There's no way he can be divorced from that. And I, I'll, I'll tarnish the luster of my association with CIA by admitting I, I don't know the circumstances. I suspect that they lifted zero COVID because even before the party Congress, it was demonstrably failing. Um, and so there was no point. Uh, it became a question of just ripping off the Band-Aid um, and dealing with the aftermath. Yeah, but so on one hand, I'll echo what everyone else has said. The good news for Xi is he's fully in charge. He 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 can rival Mao Zedong for the awesomeness and totality of his of his control. Uh, on the downside for Xi, things are not great. You know, I mean, you could go through the whole litany that I just mentioned um, and add in the the economy, and then especially the state of you know bilateral relations with the United States and increasingly with Europe. Um, because in part of the war in Ukraine and trying to support at least vocally for Russia. Um, so you're in charge, but the ship is heading toward the shoals perhaps, and uh, you may you may not want to be the captain at this juncture. Chuck? Well, before uh, responding to this question, I would like to uh, express my appreciation uh, to the fellow panelists, Emery, Bill, and John, for attending this Brookings event. I have learned a great deal over many years from your writings, especially your perspectives that differ from mine. I'm privileged to be on the same panel with you all. Now, Ryan, for your, uh, to your important essential question, I will say that I hold the conventional view that Xi Jinping remains a very strong position, just like the, the three other panelists observed. Just like the seven member of Power Bureau Standing Committee, Xi Jinping and his protege occupied six seats, plus the seventh, Wang Huning, is like-minded confident. The new state council, which will be announced in a day, is dominated by his longtime proteges. Notably, the, uh, his former chief of staff, uh, uh, Li, Li Chang and Ding Xuexiang, will serve as a uh, you know, premier and executive vice premier to two top positions. And his friend for 40 years, He Lifeng, will serve as the financial vice minister. So I don't see any contrasting signs at all. Now, personnel is policy, and this new team in the state council, uh, along with the Power Bureau, will be well positioned to carry out Xi Jinping's agenda. Now, this includes uh, some necessary policy adjustments that um, you know, our program, your, uh, Ryan, you described so well. Uh, which in a way can help address what Xi Jinping calls a dangerous storm. I mean, he probably noticed that all the challenges, domestic and, uh, and the international, as other panelists uh, pointed out. So sometimes we will expect some of the adjustment from that team. Emily, you touched upon the uh, zero COVID protests several months ago. And I just want to circle back to that to ask, with the benefit of a few months of hindsight, how does this look to you? Was it a, a significant event? Do you think it had a major effect upon uh, China's policy decision to reverse its zero COVID policies? Or was it more just sort of a traditional pattern of pressure release inside Chinese society? So I, I noticed some English translations of the white paper movement translated it as the A4 revolution. I don't think it's quite that big of a deal, but I think it's definitely much more than a protest. And yes, after a couple of months of hindsight, I think it's still a quite of a big of a deal, not because I think it was the ultimate push that changed dynamic zero COVID policy. I think it was one of the reasons why Xi Jinping and his coterie of advisors probably backed down. I think it really had to do more with the fact that numbers were already climbing and the protests then were a signal that the usual toolkit, the leadership normally would have had <clears throat> a Shanghai style lockdown, mass testing, which is not going to be available this time around. And the situation was more dire than perhaps even Shanghai was looking a month before they locked down. So in some ways the protests were important in that they cut off what would normally be a path that the party could take, um, but it probably accelerated a path that they were already thinking about. I think the most significant 
legacy of the A4 movement would be that it led for a temporary couple of days, even in Beijing, I noticed, a complete um, kind of civil disobedience movement. People were told that you had to quarantine in your house for three to five days because you had one positive case. And I had people living around me who said, I just refuse. I know that there are more cases than you're reporting. And so I just, I am not going to listen to you. I'm going for the walk. I'm taking my dog out for some air. And that was unthinkable just a couple of weeks ago before the A4 movement. And this was happening in the political capital in Beijing. So I think that it created a brief moment where people, some people, I mean, it was mostly young people were participating on the very, the two nights of the A4 movement, created a moment where they might not have seen, experienced a free internet, they might not have been alive during Tiananmen, but they had these couple of days where they could sense that some limited civil disobedi disobedience, not against the party, but against zero COVID rules was possible. And I don't know how that kind of political uh, experience, consciousness, might embed itself and, and manifest years later. But I think that is significant, especially given the fact that many of the people who were the most active were in their 20s and 30s. Before I, I switch gears to another topic, does anyone want to comment on uh, zero COVID, its reactions, the protests? Well, I, 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 we shouldn't forget the apartment fire in the room she that really seemed to be part of the trigger. And that was so striking because apparently most of those who died were Uyghurs. And normally one might not expect a lot of sympathy with the dominant Han population, but it resonated because they could all see that happening, especially in urban areas, that zero COVID could interfere with first responders and fire department responding to uh, you know, a, a tragedy in a given location. So it really resonated um, and amplified it. Um, I'd also note that while um, China seemed the regime seemed to have limited ability to control these protests. The largest I saw was probably a couple of thousand. So these weren't mass movements, but they were in many places and they clearly knew what was going on outside of their areas. Um, you know, that's a pretty rigorous surveillance state. Their inability to shut that down more rapidly was telling. Um, but there's also been a lot of the people that were out in the square, even if their faces were masked, were then detained because if they were carrying their cell phones, the Chinese government knew where they were and who they were. And there's been a silent roundup of some of the people that China wanted to make an example of in the aftermath. Um, I don't have any different views on the, on the other panelists, uh, you know, the critique about uh, COVID. I do have a question for Bill. You mentioned about the Jiang Zemin's memorial service. How that links to the you know, your overview. Could you elaborate your, your single out that one as well, along with COVID uh, lockdown? Sure. Yeah. sure. I mean, I, I it, it was, I, I think, you know, the question of, you know, coming out of the party Congress, Jiang Zemin was, was I, I assume they knew he was in very poor health. There were lots of rumors before it was officially announced he was, he was dead. So, you know, trying to figure out the timing. I also think when you have that, you know, the sort of the general, system goes into mourning mode where they they sort of pull back on you know pull back on the sort of she hagiography i think they i think there was an expectation i certainly had an expectation of a pretty pretty robust rollout of a lot more um sort of propaganda around she as either the people's leader leader or the navigator or whatever and i think that was all it was sort of, it feels like it was more maybe it didn't happen but it also i think is quite possibly was deferred and then the Jiang Zemin funeral, it also obviously coincided with the, as John had said, I think it really is the case that Omicron had broken the barriers at Pofang and it was done. And so they, it was a recognition of, of reality. And then you had the protests. And so it just it ended up, I think, being a very um, dicey couple of months. I don't think that Jiang Zemin's death or the sort of funeral arrangements had any sort of pressure on Xi Jinping in terms of what his sort of consolidation of power. I think it's just, a, as you know, looking back at, I mean, we've had, you know, Mao's funeral, Deng's funeral. These are very choreographed now, but also very sensitive and very, um, very mean guy, very sensitive periods. And so you have to get the choreography correct and the protocol correct. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ryan, if I could. Sure. I, I think that the, the incident where Hu Jintao was escorted out of the party Congress, followed by the death of Jiang Zemin, I think it, it symbolically, you know, really had an impact where 
the two figures who preceded she, um, you know, suddenly were clearly uh, one removed physically and permanently by natural causes, but the other then, you know, escorted out of the center of policy of the party. You know, it, it says that there are no alternatives to she. If you were hoping for the back, you know, behind the scenes resistance among, uh, you know, last elements of the Shanghai faction or the China youth faction, uh, that you, you needed to move on, that this was Xi Jinping's China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this gets us to a, a question that I wanted to pose to Chung, uh, which is how would you evaluate the current level of unity at the top of the Chinese Communist Party right now? Well, um, uh, Ryan, my overall assessment, as I have explained earlier, is that the Xi Jinping holds a very strong standing now. Now your question here insightfully used the words, the current level of unity at the top of the CCP. Now I do not pretend that I know how things will look five or 10 years down the road. Also, I believe that the ministry and the provincial level of leaders might hold more diversified views, uh, even including about their views about Xi Jinping, about the various policies. But at the top echelon of the CCP now, I see leadership unity, uh, partly because Xi Jinping's protégés have dominated this group. Uh, in Xi Jinping's uh, words, they constitute uh, so-called the importance of the small number of the key officials, Guan Jian Sao Su in Chinese, partly uh, may be attributed to the fact that this level of leaders have much uh, more uh, information on domestic and international situation than the below levels of the, than the low levels of the leadership, and thus, they are likely more supportive of Xi Jinping's decisions. Now, let me also quickly share with you a couple of other observations about the leadership unity. Now, as we know, uh, in the previous party Congress, there were purges of the power bureau member on the eve of the Congress, like uh, Sun Zhenzhai in the last party Congress, the 19th party Congress, and a few political uh, power bureau member, including a power bureau standing committee member around the 18th party Congress. But such purges did not happen at the 20th Party Congress. Now, also increasingly, those who are strong uh, candidates for the Power Bureau, especially Hu Chunhua, uh, who did not make it, but also Xiao Jie, uh, Zhang Qingwei, and, um, and uh, Wang Yong, you know, they are also quite a strong candidate, uh, did not make it to the Power Bureau, just received the power, uh, position of vice chairman of MPC or CPPCC. Now, these sorts of deal are frequently made um, the, and the, the Chinese public may perceive the leadership unity as having been maintained. Over to you. I'd like to uh, switch gears to Bill for a second. Um, I watched recently uh, Liu He's presentation in Davos, uh, where he provided soothing words about how China is open for business and uh, inviting and encouraging foreign capital to, uh, to flow into China. How do you think uh, we should evaluate uh, his comments? How seriously should we take them? And what signs should we be looking for uh, as indicators of seriousness of purpose on the part of China to make uh, the Chinese market more attractive for foreign capital? So uh, Liu He is the vice premier for another, what, 12 hours, I think. Um, okay. this, was, this was, I think, his, his swan song going to Davos. Uh, he gave a talk. He also had a private uh, meal with some some big heavy hitters in industry and finance. Uh, I'm going to quote from a, a Financial Times report on that meal um, where somebody attending said, China is back. It was very much like 2017. And of course, 2017 was when Xi Jinping went to Davos and gave this speech that was really, you know, Donald Trump had just become president. And it was basically every saying everything that Donald Trump wasn't or sort of the exact opposite. And it was very, very opportunistic to sort of give this message of we believe in free trade, multilateralism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that the messaging from Liu, I mean, it fits with the exit from, from dynamic zero COVID. It fits with the, uh, the really significant economic stress that's going on in the country. Um, it fits with the pressures on decoupling. The Chinese are very, very concerned about the potential for supply chain decoupling that, you know, the U S has led the way, but you're seeing more pressures from countries in Europe. And so I think this was, this was an attempt to, to really preempt that and switch the narrative back to, you know, we're back, we're back in business. Like it, like it was now, um, 
I think though, since the Davos, we've had Wang Yi also go to Europe with a different set of messaging that um, I think was not as constructive, at least in European capitals and to European businesses. We've had the balloon incident. Um, I think, you know, one of the one of the key things to look for, and again, it's one thing what they say to foreign investors and foreign money. It's really what they talk about with with private entrepreneurs, private businesses in China. And that was a that has been a big theme of the two meetings. Uh, she held a breakout meeting where he really, you know, tried to give this uh, sort of a, a, a fill up or more give more confidence to private entrepreneurs. I'm not sure, um, but it's also wrapped. That was the same meeting where she also talked about where he specifically called out the U.S. for. Um, uh, implementing all around containment, encirclement, and suppression against China. He also, again, re reiterated the need for the entrepreneurs to be patriotic. And he talked about the need for um, sort of self-reliance and, and, and self-strengthening in science and technology. So it, it is not back to sort of free-for-all private entrepreneur. I think it's very much a, a managed and channeled top down. If you are in these specific lanes, you'll probably be okay as a private entrepreneur. And that probably will apply also, I think, to foreign businesses. So in general, the messaging, I think it, it's muddied. And, you know, really what matters is not what Leo He says. It matters what the new, the new Premier Li Qiang says, and it matters what substantive policies come out of the new leadership over the next few weeks and a couple of months. Because I think there's a fair amount of justified skepticism, for example, for Xi Jinping's comments earlier this week, because he said all these things before in different forms. And he said them before, and then months later or soon thereafter, there were pretty significant crackdowns. Right. John, uh, Bill just referenced the spy balloon. And I want to take advantage of the opportunity of having you here to ask how you would interpret it. Uh, some people have interpreted uh, the timing of the spy balloon as sort of a deliberate provocation and challenge to the United States. Others have uh, characterized it as an example of China's bureaucratic stovepiping. What, how, how do you see it and, and what long-term effects, if any, do you uh, foresee? I'm glad you recognize me as, you know, a leading expert on high altitude balloons. Uh, I, didn't know the program, <laughs> I didn't know the program existed until, uh, until it was uh, floating over Montana. Um, and then we quickly got a, a fire hose of information coming out of the U.S. government that this had been one of many, you know, that four or five others had either encroached on or, or crossed the United States previously. Uh, apparently, it took the U.S. government, the IC, and the military a while to figure out that there were balloons floating over or adjacent to American soil. Uh, so that was interesting. Now, if, if Xi Jinping is truly able to decide when to launch a balloon, apparently from Hainan Island, so that it appears over Montana just in time to short circuit Secretary Blinken's visit, then they truly are strategic geniuses and we should just you know, <laughs> bow down. Um, I, I suspect that in some respects, this is similar to what happened in 2012 when Secretary of Defense Robert Gates was in China and the Chinese flew for the first time their stealth fighter, the J-20. Um, and then Gates created an awkward atmosphere at a reception where he challenged Xi over whether, I mean, Hu Jintao over whether he should interpret you know, something from this. And from the look on whose face reportedly, he didn't know what the secretary was talking about. Uh, these are programs of record. Um, I'm not sure this is strictly speaking a PLA program or an example of military civil fusion where a uh, balloon corporation has gotten government support to do this. Um, but uh, I, I doubt that, you know, Xi Jinping was told that 10 days prior they would be launching, you know, and will float over the United States. and. It was interesting that uh, after the Fuhrer and the shootdown, um, the U.S. government, through various U.S. media, had basically acknowledged that the balloon was probably carried by unusual upper-level winds um, by the jet stream north of where the Chinese intended for it to go. Uh, so it was an interesting episode, mostly because for what it, I think, revealed or as a symptom of the state of U.S.-China relations, you know, that, that this alone could derail what was supposed to be the key Secretary of State visit to continue the reset that Biden and she announced at Bali um, at the G20. And then they were going to move forward. You know, the U.S. is hosting APEC. So um, Xi Jinping in all likelihood will be visiting the United States later this year. And so ideally what both sides want is for 
an agenda to be hammered out so that there can be, you know, a mutually productive meeting, at least one that does no damage. So all that's kind of up in the air now, not to not to make a pun, but um, uh, they're, they're still going to have to get something back on track unless they want the message of the uh, the APEX summit to be that the relations are so poor that the two leaders couldn't even have a, you know, a sidebar, which, which I think is unlikely. Um, so I think it shows where we are in the relationship that our domestic, you know, uh, public opinion really matters. Uh, all the polling from Pew and others show that 80% of Americans have a negative view of China and view it as um, a, a pretty large plurality, view it as the, the most significant strategic challenge we face, which has been the position of the last two administrations. Um, and, and so I, I really worry that the, it really underscored and demonstrated the lack of support for anything but kind of strategic enmity. Um, and I, I worry that, you know, um, while there's a lot of chatter in the U.S. about preparing for war over Taiwan and various generals and admirals opining that it could happen sooner rather than later, um, that the constraints on crisis are much less. That um, if you look at previous crises in U.S.-China relations, whether that's the Belgrade embassy, embassy bombing or the EP3 collision by a Chinese fighter in 2001, that the factors that allow us to quickly resolve those and move on are all missing. They've all been removed. Um, and so rather than preparing for war, I, I think we should spend some time at a, in policy preparing for what will, you know, seems like inevitability of crisis. There will be something else, you know, and the balloon, the balloon incident and, the, and then Secretary or Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan show that crises right now between the U.S. and China can occur not because of policy decisions by either side, but just because of the nature of the of the rivalry and the low level of U.S.-China relations. Mm -hmm. John, you've provided a, I think, a a really thorough diagnosis of how the incident played out. Looking at it from the U.S. perspective, I wonder if if Chung, Emily, or Bill would be willing to sort of share from the Chinese perspective how they interpreted or or process their way through this uh, this episode. Maybe Emery first. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I was I was in Taiwan at that point, and Taiwan, of course, had its own kind of hullabaloo about the balloons, because it being so close to China, it's intercepted. It turns out a lot of floating entities. At first, it wasn't clear if there were surveillance balloons. Later, uh, the military said they were only meteorological balloons. One of them fell down over Taiwan just last month. But the collective reaction, I think, was kind of a shoulder shrug because Taiwan is mostly mostly used to it. And so I think that reinforces John's point, which is it is our impressions, our understandings of the other side that really shape how we react to these circumstances. Though, of course, surveillance, I think, on all three sides has increased. Um, from, from the China side, it was interesting how there seemed to be a moment of hesitation at first where they were figuring out how to calibrate their response. And I feel like, Ryan, you might have written a really good Twitter thread about this at one point. But then they came out full force and hit back with their own accusations that the U.S. had launched their own surveillance entities and done aerial surveillance in particular over Xinjiang and Tibet, something that the U.S. flat out on NPR even came out and said, we just absolutely do not do. So it was really frustrating because it became a pure he said, she said debate where both sides were not giving each other room at all and were completely on, on different sides of the different sides of the um, of the issue. But but I think on the China side, it, it was interesting that they were kind of given a choice to stick with the semi-apology they first were, were issued with and, and then decided that they were just going to go full force. And I think that, I mean, I read this pessimistically that they've kind of resolved, resigned themselves to the idea that this year is going to be a tough year with the U.S. on top of the semiconductor export bans, on top of a number of bipartisan legislative bills and uh, the presidential elections coming up that have to do with Taiwan or China and that they were not going to give on this particular issue. Well, um, uh, John and Emily said so well, I do not have much to add. Just from my observation of the Chinese 
reaction. First of all, there's a no a kind of monolithic uh, reaction. Different people, different group, uh, different uh, you know sectors have different uh, reaction, and the public opinion also shift a little bit. Now, just to go back to uh, when U.S. Um, you know media cover that uh, uh, I think it's February twenty eight. Then also a few days later, I think uh, 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 January twenty eight. Then February twenty uh, February second, that the U.S. informed Chinese embassy. And um, and the Chinese government actually uh, apologized, thinking that it was a mistake, that it was not intentional. Then two days late, two days later, a couple of days later, um, Secretary Blinken informed China he will cancel that meeting. So it's a very interesting Chinese interpretation. It's a parallel mirror, you know, parallel to what Zhang interpreted the, the Chinese military. But Chinese think the deep state wanted to you know, stop that visit. And uh, this is a Chinese version of the conspiracy. But the the late what happened later on, especially you when you are shooting broom, the public opinion shifted a little bit. Previously, it's more neutral or sometimes even criticized the Chinese government. But then they think this is uh, again it's reflected U.S. bully and etc. So as Emily said so well, this was reaction nationalism is on the rise. So that's uh, that's the, uh, the the again the Chinese reaction. But I think it's a uh, it's uh, still not a definitive. Uh, again, I still observe. Uh, that uh, many people have different views about uh, why why um, you know China um, uh, should should not uh, even do further to explain to provide evidence or uh, if it's really it's a spy room China should do more and etc. So again, it's different people have different view. But my, my worry is this kind of conspiracy theories are uh, reinforced and the both uh, sides are very very tough. Uh, on, on the other side. So that's it's added to what John said early on. There's a no mechanism, more uh, care, more other, uh, uh, other effort to try to cool down and to reduce tension. Up until now, we still do not know when you know, uh, uh, Secretary Blinken will uh, go to China or whether will we go to China in the near future. Okay. Right. Bill? All right, thanks. Um, just to follow on, on the great comments, I think another thing that um, really upset the PRC side of the officials is the the US government, I think, launched a, a very aggressive campaign to brief dozens and dozens of other countries about this, what they say is this global surveillance program the Chinese are running, which I think drove the the policymakers absolutely nuts in Beijing. Um, and it's a very interesting strategy to do that, to really, instead of just focusing on domestic, just sort of why is your balloon over, China, over the US, it was to really expand it out and sort of point out that China's doing this in all these other countries, which goes very much against the image that, and then sort of the prop, some of the propaganda themes that we see out of Beijing, where you know China respects the global rules, China respects the international order, China respects sovereignty. The U.S. is a bad actor. The U.S. is the number one spy state. Blah blah blah. And the U.S. really flipped that and said, "Well, look, they do it too." And I think yeah. that really so, something has changed, and it it may it, you know the balloon incident may have just been sort of the sort of one in a long stream of incidents. It may have been the, the, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, but I, it really feels like over the last couple of weeks, there's been a significant shift and escalation in rhetoric around the U.S. and what the U.S. does. And I think that um, for me, it's, it's extremely worrisome. I think we're in, heading into a much more fraught and dangerous phase in U.S.-China relations. John, does that sound uh, right to you? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was just going to comment, though, that, you know, I think that the uh, the statement of regret that came out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs while the balloon was still over the U.S. Be, and before the shoot down, it, it kind of paralleled President Bush's non-apology after the uh, EP3 collided with our surveillance aircraft in 2001, where I, I think they actually were intending to provide a way to resolve this without escalation. Of course, the problem is U.S. China relations are not what they were in 2001, uh, and that uh, the balloon was still over the U.S. and you know Biden was going to face a decision to have to shoot it down. So it was too early to sort of close the door. Now I would note that if the government you know re reports to press since the balloon became you know entered our consciousness that they had flown 30 or 40 of these since around 2018. Um, not all of them, of course, transited the US, but transited of many other countries. Um, so I'm waiting for the next balloon, you know, and it's interesting that we're now a month, month and a half or so on, and uh, I haven't heard about, and I think we would hear about the next time the US detects China's launched a large upper altitude surveillance balloon. 
Um, so that's interesting. And I'd watch that space that, you know, if maybe the revelation has caused a reconsideration on the part of Beijing, especially in what, as Emily noted, is likely to be a tough uh, next year and two. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I'd like to transition us briefly to another topic uh, that we're living through in real time, which is the Lianhui, or the two legislative sessions which are taking place in Beijing and are, are going to conclude fairly soon. If you were a headline writer uh, right now, what headline would you use to describe uh, what we're seeing coming out of uh, the Long Hui? And, and what do you think it tells us sort of on a forward looking basis about uh, the direction of Chinese politics? Um, Emily, can we start with you and then uh, we'll work way around to Bill, John and Chung? Sure, I'll be brief because to be honest, this has never been my forte and I read people like <laughs> me to figure out what's going on. I, I think this year for me, the theme has been restructure and realign. Restructure, obviously, because of the the ways that important ministries like industry and technology have been restructured, but also realigning basically the entire state apparatus to fit existing priorities that have become now the number one, two, three issues, things like technological resilience, reshoring supply chains, kind of the same issues that that we're talking about right now in the U.S., uh, strengthening financial oversight making sure you're upgrading policies to oversee new types of financial transactions and data regulations in um, our high-tech age. Of course, we just have to see what uh, whether or not these priorities are actually materialized on the ground. You know, I'm skeptical, for example, that cutting 5% of your civil service and cutting salaries up to, a, a, you know, 50% in some cases is going to help morale, um, especially when you're increasing regulation so much. But um, you're kind of seeing the entire state apparatus realign itself, which is which is interesting. Yeah, Bill. Um, so I, I agree with Emily. I think the the restructure realign is an interesting way to put it. I think that um, the other things to look at and 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 some of these themes, there there's continuity with um, 2018. There's also obviously a lot of continuity with the 20th Party Congress. Is what you're seeing again is this sort of continuing um, sort of party eating the state. Where, um, you know, and, and we still don't know the full details on the restructuring because the party bits have not yet come out. There was the second plenum the week before the two sessions, but and there was a very short communique. There should be a longer decision document with more details probably early next week. Um, and I think we'll get a better sense if there's these news commissions. But it really is, I think, the theme of centralizing the party is in command, the state the state is now just executing as opposed to really making policy. Um, I think also though, and this aligns with the themes out of the 20 party Congress, we see significant, you know, from just from Xi's comments to private businesses, to um, the, the Jiangsu delegation at the National People's Congress, to the, to the PLA and people's armed police delegations, you know, it's, it's hardening the system. It's more security when it, you know, balancing security, security and development, which means security gets, gets a sort of a higher, um, focus because it's been, they, I think they see as security and development being economic, uh, being out of balance. Um, it's again, trouble tripling down on self-reliance, science and technology innovation, hardening the system for a very difficult period, both in terms of domestic problems, but I think really in terms of the international environment, specifically the relations with the US, but also, as, as I think John said, also with Europe and the EU because of what's happening with in Ukraine and because of the way the Chinese are, you know, their straddle where they're neutral, but not really, um, I think is really very few people still believe that there's any sort of pretense of not really being on Putin's side in the war. John? It's hard to improve on Bill and Emily, but uh, yeah, it's secure, security to the forefront. Um, I mean, the, some of the more overheated comments in some of the U.S. press is that this is a war cabinet. I think Chung Lee would agree that this is not a war cabinet, but it is a cabinet designed to um, really emphasize stealth, stealth, self-strengthening, indigenous development, especially in high tech because of the uh, decoupling actions of the United States in the technology realm over semiconductors and artificial intelligence, um, and, and a need for you know really tightening the belt and preparing for even uh, tougher times ahead. You know that they, they may be getting a boom and a bounce coming out of zero COVID policy. That's sort of a natural you know re-expansion of consumption and and external trade. But um, they, they know that, you know, the, the most, I think the most frequently cited word in Xi Jinping's speech at the party Congress was struggle. Um, it's not the first time he's emphasized the concept, but he's doubling down. 
uh, uh, the previous, uh, you know, the 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 three uh, fellow panelists said um, what they said are uh, very very important. I I agree. I just wanted to look at the um, different perspective, more on the Chinese perspective. What's the message they wanted to send? And uh, uh, of course, that uh, we may or may not uh, buy that. Now, here's my headline: Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership uh, maintain that Beijing has a much better chance to generate social political stability, leadership unity, technological innovation or indigenous innovation, and the policy continuity, as Bill said, especially in terms of the common prosperity uh, in China. So compared to what lies on the horizon on the other side of the Pacific, now that uh, message is uh, certainly uh, could be disturbing for us, for the United States. We do need to address uh, not only just by our rhetoric, but uh, by our own policy improvement to really improve, you know, our own is the best way to compete uh, with China. So our overall uh, goal for the uh, Biden administration is competition. If we really want to competition in all these areas, we need to address uh, China's messages. Again, of course, this is Chinese propaganda. This is Chinese objective, but they certainly not only target the Chinese uh, public, but also target other regions like ASEAN countries, like uh, Bill and uh, uh, and uh, John said, you know, EU especially, and also countries in the South. So that's the message. That's the things I think that uh, for any strategic thinkers in this country need to think very seriously. John, can I just ask you to follow up on that? How much purchase do you think that this propaganda push may have, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia? Is there... Uh, is there a receptive audience for the uh, for the headline that Chung just described of of China presenting itself as providing a better model for uh, stability, continuity, development, growth, innovation, etc.? Well, you asked me, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, I, I think that that's a lot more complicated message to be received and believed uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think they're still mostly oriented around not getting caught in the middle between the two elephants trampling the grasses. So you're, you're, they're going to be concerned about China for all the right reasons from our perspective. It's uh, operations in the South China Sea. Um, it's kind of growing frosty diplomacy. Uh, wolf warrior tactics. Um, I'm certain that Ching Gong's speech on the margins of the MPC got people's attention with its new, more public focus on the U.S. as the uh, center of all the things that are challenging China. Um, so I, I don't know that, you know, they're, they're going to remain tightly integrated. I mean, China is the top trading partner of 120 out of 195 countries in the world. So that's a kind of sway that doesn't go away overnight. Um, for these people, a lot of the part of the regions you mentioned, economic growth, especially coming out of COVID is even more important. And China is gonna remain important to that. But uh, I, I think that the, you know, the nature, the front that China, the face that China puts toward the world, even though it's perceived a little less poorly in the global South than in, than in the developed North, um, I, I think that's just signaling to all of them that they're going to have to be a lot more careful, that the straddle or hedging that they've all been doing for the last decade and more is going to get harder. Um, and the U.S. is going to have more asks, especially in, in, in Southeast Asia and in the Indo-Pacific, um, and that Europe is also going to have to um, balance more between its security amplified by the situation in Ukraine and its economic investments in China. Mm -hmm. John, uh, John recently uh, suggested that some commentators have uh, identified the new leadership around Xi Jinping as a war cabinet. Uh, other Western media have described these people as all yes men uh, who owe their, their rise to Xi Jinping. I know you have a, a different view on this, so I was just wanted to invite you to share your perspective given the amount of time you've spent studying these leaders. Well, uh, certainly that I was, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, a war cabinet yet. And although there's a lot of uh, them advanced from the uh, military industrial complex, particularly from aerospace, there are quite a number of them are very 
very capable, actually, um, uh, rock scientists. That certainly is a very interesting phenomenon we should watch, but I don't think that uh, uh, it's a war cabinet like that, that level. And also these leaders also have substantial economic experience when serving as the governor, party secretary in the, in the region. Now for your question about uh, Xi Jinping, your perception of Xi Jinping is uh, surrounded by a yes man. I think it, uh, it's, a, it's largely true. Uh, by the way, there's a, finally a woman leader, uh, Chen Yiqing or Sheng Yiqing, still we do not know what's the right uh, pronunciation. I mean, the two both are correct, who will serve as the state councillor on the new uh, 10 member of the executive committee of the state council. But astonishingly to many of us, there's no woman on the 24 seat power bureau. Now, here, let me make a few points about the perception that Xi Jinping is surrounded by this man very quickly. The, uh, again, it's, this perception is true, but it should be subjected to a more balanced and foresighted analysis. Let me very quickly mention four points. First, every uh, leader in the top echelon of power is within Xi Jinping's circle of trust, but each differs in their degree of loyalty. Second, as Xi Jinping has decisively defeated the prominent factions, as Zhang mentioned, uh, you know, whether Tuan Pai or Chinese Communist Youth League or Princeling or Shanghai faction, new factions and the new splits between Xi Jinping's own loyalists will likely arise as they compete to best fulfill Xi Jinping's priority from their perspective. Now, certainly, one may argue that the elite uh, recruitment in present-day China, while not primarily uh, driven by meritocracy, really, uh, rarely or uh, hardly allows incompetent officials to reach its highest uh, ranks, except a couple of uh, uh, exceptions. So generally, these are people are quite, uh, uh, quite capable. And finally, it is premature to assume that the Xi Jinping's protégés will not affect major changes in the years to come. After all, Xi Jinping himself was once considered a yes man before becoming the top leader in 2012. Over. Thank you. John, John do you want to come in quickly? And then I have a, a question for Bill yeah, as well. I, I want to use the opportunity that, to have this with, with Chung Li. Is, 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 I'll ask the group, but especially Chung Li, is now that she is confident that the next uh, generation of leaders at the next level at the Politburo State and the Standing Committee and the State Council are his people. Will he have the opportunity or incentive now to return to an orderly leadership succession? Or is he going to be determined to be uh, you know, a leader for life? No, I think he must address that issue. The party establishment uh, you know, gave him a chance for third term. And, uh, but if uh, by the end of the third term, he does not either, he fails to identify a successor or does not introduce a, a plan uh, or process for succession. I think uh, even his protege, will have some different uh, view. I think that uh, your question is excellent. Uh, my answer is, of course, we do not know. I mean, Xi Jinping really thinks about, but uh, I think that uh, the uh, political pressure will increase. And uh, I would like to hear Bill's uh, account, uh, response on that one. He is also really a leading expert in uh, elite politics in China. Bill? Thank you. You're very kind. I'm too kind. Nothing like you. Um, and by the way, uh, Chun Li has a great primer on the um, two sessions, which I hope you'll put in the show notes. Um, it's very, very educational and useful. Um, I would just say to the point that John's point and to Charlie's point is, I mean, right now we're looking for at least another 10 years of Xi Jinping because there is no one on the sort of really in the Politburo or, or the, the standing committee who looks like they could be a successor. So even if he were to uh, to, to the question, move towards something more orderly, we probably most likely, and you never say with 100% certainty, but most likely we wouldn't see that until the 21st Party Congress, and then it would be a five-year period. And now, of course, Xi Jinping is 10 years younger than President Joe Biden. So 10 years from today, he will be Joe Biden's age, and Joe Biden is still president and still functioning. So he isn't, I mean, there there is 10 years in that system. There's no reason to think he can't be fully a functioning leader in 10 years. Um, I, I do think the um, it goes back to sort of, I think, looking at other studies of authoritarian systems is, and, and also the PRC's history is, how does he appoint a successor who, and when he looks like he's power leader for life, and then the person gets a little too uppity or threatening, or, you know, we've seen this before. And so um, I think it is, you sort of may have short medium term stability, but I think they have introduced some potential for some longer term instability inside that system. 
Emily, do you have uh, any thoughts you'd like to share on the success in question? I think we're still still on mute. I my I, I apologize that I missed most of the conversation because my Wi-Fi was going in and out. Uh, the the question really uh, was one that John posed about uh, how will the succession process take place, and if she does not um, provide clarity on the succession process, will it produce instability inside the Chinese system? I I heard some of the tail end of what Bill was saying, and I I think he's probably covered it. I really apologize about that. No, no problem. Uh, Bill, I know that it's impossible for us to get inside Xi Jinping's head, uh, but I'm going to ask the impossible. Uh, when you sort of, what is your mental map of what keeps Xi Jinping up at night or the Chinese leadership up at night? What issues do you think are sort of front of mind uh, for them and, and are, are occupying their attention? I, I wish I knew the answer. I think a lot of us wish we knew the answer. Um, you know, in some ways we can go to the... Um, to their map of the, the restructuring that they just announced for um, uh, uh, for the um, uh, at, at the two sessions, and you can look at sort of what their what their top issues are in terms of things around. I mean, they're looking, you know, rural rural revitalization. Rural issues are huge for for Xi Jinping. Obviously, the U.S.-China relationship and things around science, technology, security. Um, I think um, there's. You know, in the general, the economic issues and and how to how to get the economy performing again in a way that keeps people bought into the system and a, away from the streets, so to speak, um, but also doesn't take us back to the go go years of the sort of early the end of the Hu era, early Xi era. Um, so that's sort of a long way to answer, but I think I think they are signaling to us. I mean, you can look at the priorities in 20th Party Congress documents, and then really this restructuring, I think, is looking, that's a, a, probably a pretty good guide to what some of their real pain points are. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Emily, uh, you are in Taiwan right now. Oh, I think we just lost her. Em Emily, you're in Taiwan right now, and... Uh, People in Taiwan are watching the, the zigs and zags of Chinese politics. How, how do you think that they are interpreting it? Do they see it as generating unpredictability uh, or a sign of pragmatism, something else? What's your sense? It is something that is absolutely dominating headlines here in Taiwan, and particularly because it's now a presidential campaign year, just like the U.S., they're about to go into a presidential election in January. So cross-strait issues tend to be one of the primary at the forefront of presidential elections, unlike during local elections. I think what's really um, shocked Taiwan is the consolidation of power under Xi Jinping, and that was most evident here in the island during the party congress when Xi Jinping just had people escort Hu Jintao out. And here that made big news. It was something obviously that we cared about in US media, but in Taiwan, it really sent shockwaves through the system because the understanding, at least from a Republic of China, a KMT kind of bureaucracy, and therefore a Chinese Communist Party bureaucracy, is at the very least, you respect your elders and you don't cannibalize your own. And here was a former leader, a current leader escorting out, essentially, essentially escorting out a former leader. Um, that really, really scared people. The other is that despite the kind of mismatched population and military capabilities, at least in numbers that Taiwan used to have against China, that does not feel the case anymore. People are very much aware here in Taiwan that their reservist system is, is woefully undertrained and too small in number, that the equipment they're buying may not be right for the military challenge they could face from China in the future. And that technology wise, China is far superior in many aspects than Taiwan was. And so you talk to former military commanders who were submarine unit um, commanders or who were artillery specialists in the 80s uh, who saw live action maybe in the last uh, uh, the, 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 the last crisis. Um, before that, who say, if I had to face the Chinese again, you know, I've interviewed these people, if I had to face the Chinese again, I wouldn't be as confident as I was then. At the time, I had absolutely no doubts about who would win in a minor skirmish like that. It would be Taiwan. So it is going to be a major, major issue. I think that the question facing Taiwan is what to do about this. And you see the KMT here, the opposition political party currently, already start to rebrand itself. 
it is very strenuous if you ask them now that that they are not a pro China party. And so that's really shown you just how far Taiwanese politics has moved even since the last presidential election in 2020. Um, being pro-China, being labeled that is kind of a death sentence in Taiwanese politics already. That kind of pro, pro-unification with no strings attached identity has, has basically aged out, died out on the island. Instead, uh, they're emphasizing that they know how to talk to China and how to deal with them because the KMT structure still understands that it has some parallels with the CCP structure. And so I think that just shows you that no matter what your political affiliation is on the island, the number one threat is China. And it's not a question of whether or not it's a threat. It's about how to deal with it. Is it open confrontation? Is it about bringing in American congressional leaders and upping your deterrence politically or militarily? Or is it about dialogue? Is there hope for dialogue? And I think that the presidential election in January is a a big referendum on what Taiwanese people think on that. Thank you. We have five minutes left. I want to... uh introduce a couple of questions that we've received from our audience. Uh, I, will, I will bundle two of them together with, uh, to you and give each of you a chance to either comment on those questions or if you have a final word that you'd like to offer on something unrelated, uh, you can as well. So this will be our, our final round. Uh, the questions, um, one is from Paul Frondano, who's a retired uh, former senior intelligence service uh, member. And he asked about uh, if the panelists could comment on the idea of China as a peaking power and what, whether we should expect a war with China sooner rather than later. Uh, we also have a question from Lean Vervaki, who's a correspondent with Volkstrand, who asked about uh, in the wake of COVID-19, uh, how are Chinese consumers going to react? Are they going to be buoyant and sort of uh, return to go-go spending days, or are they going to be more cautious in in how they return to the market? So those are the two questions. You're welcome to respond to those, or if you have a a final thought that you'd like to introduce instead, uh, that is fine as well. Uh, John, why don't we start with you, and then we'll go to Chung, Bill, and give Emily the final word. So I know Paul very well. He was one of the people that taught me my trade at CIA uh, about 10,000 years ago. yeah, this, this idea of peaking power, there, there's kind of a book up out, out on this by Hal Brands and uh, Michael um, Beckley. Yeah, uh, who, th- the problem is it sort of is, is part of the drumbeat that, you know, for that war is likely and soon. And it's the idea that China, you know, is going to have to do something sooner rather than later because its relative power advantage um, with the United States or with Taiwan is going to decline rather than continue to rise. Um, that's not how I read the Chinese view of themselves. Um, I, I think they know they're in a great power rivalry, of course. Um, of course, the U.S. is making some things harder uh, as, part of, as part of that dynamic. Um, they do face daunting demographic challenges, but um, I, I don't think that's really going to shape policy or drive decisions over something like uh, conflict in the near term. Thank you. Chung? Uh, um I think that we should really avoid two extremes. One is that uh, uh, China becomes so powerful, so strong. This is, I think, is the current, uh, the prevailing mood. You know, uh, our tough policy towards China, not because of our meaning U.S., uh, our arrogance, but uh, largely because our uh, fear, uh, including legitimate fear or concern, anxieties. It's not because China's weakness, it's because China's strengths that uh, we, we hardly uh, faces this kind of challenges you know, since World War II. During the Cold, uh, Cold War, uh, Soviet Union was a military power, but China is a really, it's a kind of all comprehensive a military, economic, technology, you name it. So there's a, 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 such a concern. So I do not see that uh, 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 on one hand, China will surface the United States in the near future. No, it's impossible. I don't think a Chinese leader, I mean, uh, are crazy enough to think that way. And um, unless uh, in the in the next uh, years, decades, U.S. make uh, you know, a lot of a lot of mistakes, I do not. I I I still strongly believe that we can fix some of the problem, and uh, uh, when time moves on. But at the same time, that I think more worried, we underestimate China. I think that uh, uh, certainly certain corners of the uh, of the of the country, maybe not the majority. I think that would be a mistake. That uh, China 
uh, despite all demographic challenges, because uh, and also despite the lack of legitimacy and the potential succession uh, problem, potential mistake over Taiwan. I think overall, I think that China still has a lot of things to continue to develop. And particularly the leadership em emphasizes common prosperity. I think it's common prosperity for Chinese view. It's not a bad idea, but it's uh, unfortunately mischaracterized by Chinese entrepreneurs and by foreign analysts. Uh, if they can deliver, it will stimulate the China's engine of growth, namely uh, uh, investment, consumption, and the foreign trade. Of course, in the past few years, that none of this is doing well, but uh, this probably can fix. Uh, so if that's the case, China, despite all the problems, all the challenges, will rebound. This is related with the other question about COVID. I think the revenge consumption is already underway. I see that there's some kind of positive growth rate for this year. Over. Bill? So I would just say that um, to the second part of the question about sort of is, is war inevitable, um, I think we all have to hope it's not. It would be disaster for everybody. I also think it only would happen if there were really some really poor um, policymaking on both sides. Um, and so, you know, we have to figure out a way to both sides see each other as posing challenges and threats. We have to figure out ways to manage that. I think that's at least the rhetoric out of DC, but rhetoric and reality aren't matching up. In terms of this peaking power concept, I mean, I, I really think it, it's, I, I tend to really try and stay away from kind of binary views of China. I think that um, there's a lot, there are a lot of problems to demographics, debt, environmental issues, water, you get on the list. Um, it's also still in many places a remarkably undeveloped country and remarkably relatively still quite poor. And the leadership is clearly with things like the new development concept, maybe, you know, high quality development, common prosperity, whatever that really means. Uh, the, um, uh, you know, they are they are trying to um, address a lot of these issues. And, and so, so the general concept of socialist, the socialist modern country, right, which is sort of the goal um, that I think offers a lot of potential for continued development and continued wealth creation if if they do it correctly. Now, that's obviously the big if. So, um, you know, I joke years ago, like there was a book, famous book, some of you may have read it called The Coming Co Colossal of China. I joke years ago, like if I were to write a book, it would be The Coming Muddle Through, but then no one would buy it. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, honestly, I think, I think sort of, but again, so you need to be sort of binary and extreme. That's what sells. Um, the last, so that's my comment on that question. On the other question about consumption, so far the data is, I think, been disappointing in terms of revenge consumption. I think there's still a lot of wariness around, um, you know, I think zero COVID, the economic downturn has caused people to really, a lot of people lost income, um, lost savings. They need to rebuild their savings and just be more cautious. So again, it comes down to, I think, a lot of what we see over the next weeks and months coming out of the two sessions in terms of policies that both encourage consumption as well as increase confidence. And if the leadership can put that in place that I think there is a good chance for a significant improvement. If it really is sort of the models we've seen lately, lots of promises, but not a lot of substance, then I think it's gonna be a problem. Thank you. Emily? I, I, I agree with everyone. I don't like binaries. I don't like extremes. I think it depends on what we mean by power. If we mean, is China forever going to be a country that through economic coercion can, can cripple supply chains and change corporate behavior or to reset standards or to menace regional uh, territorial claims, maybe not, but it still has enormous room to become a hugely influential, prosperous country. Um, and that might not be the, the bad thing. I, I wouldn't call that peaking, you know, I call that progress. Well, this has been uh, an incredibly rich conversation. My only regret is that we don't have more time, uh, but we'll have to invite you back for, uh, for an encore, uh, hopefully sometime soon. Thank you for, for sharing your insights, for the diversity of viewpoints that were reflected in this conversation. And thank you to our global audience for tuning in today. Goodbye. <laughs>